achievement. It's something we talk about regularly here in the pages of success. As the tagline says, what achievers read. We make it our job to bring you the insights from the world's greatest achievers so you can conquer your big dreams as they have. In our January edition, we featured 25 of the top people in personal development. Tony Robbins graced the cover of that issue, and this month we have him here for an exclusive audio interview, especially for our issue on achievement. For the past three decades, Tony has served as an advisor to leaders around the world. He is a recognized authority in a variety of areas and has impacted millions of lives through his books, products, and speaking. What began as his youthful desire to help others transform their lives has turned into his lifelong crusade. Tony, welcome back to Success. Always a pleasure to sit down with you, my friend. Thank you, Darren. Great to hear your voice again. So, Tony, since we're focused on achievement this month, um, let's start with a tough question for you. Obviously, we're aware you've had a tremendous number of achievements over the years. Tell us out of everything you've accomplished, what are you most proud of? What achievement gives you the most, say, soulful fulfillment? Wow, that that is a tough question. Um, gosh, I, I I don't know if there's one thing I'd say that I've used my life in a, in a path of service, as corny as that may sound. I mean, my daily prayer before I get on stage, when I get up in the morning and I do this process with myself, I call my priming, putting myself in state every single day uh, before I go to serve is is I'm, my prayer is to be a blessing in people's lives, whoever I meet. And so... I think I've had the privilege of being able to be a blessing in a lot of people's lives uh, by their reaction, you know, to have an impact on millions of people from a hundred countries and every kind of culture you can imagine. Um, so there are all kinds of highlights. But maybe this year, a highlight for me is going to be, you know, when I was uh, a kid, when I was 11, we had no money and no food. And Thanksgiving kind of magnifies that situation because everybody else is celebrating, you know, so deeply on that day. And my life was changed because somebody came and fed my family, somebody I still don't know to this day. And it changed my life and that it made me think that, you know, if strangers care about me, then I, I, I'm going to care about strangers. Everyone in my family said, nobody gives a damn. And so I swore that someday I'd pay it forward. And so when I was 17, I fed two families and it was one of the more rewarding things in my life. And then four and then eight. And then I got my friends involved and then my companies grew. And, you know, then I just got to where I was feeding two million people a year for like the last 15 years. And then I started matching what we did in the foundation, myself and my wife. So we're feeding four million a year. So the idea that a kid that couldn't feed himself at this stage of my life could have the privilege to bring food and hope to families in need at the scale of a hundred million in a year. It's God's grace and it's, and it's focus and it's hard work, but it's certainly, there's a good deal of grace in it. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I think that's one thing I'm maybe one of the things I'm most proud of. I think that's amazing what you're doing and, uh, uh, love that sort of contribution to the world. Now I want to get your opinion on something. I think the majority of people live their lives on autopilot, just sort of getting through each day, quote unquote, getting stuff done without noticing what they're doing or what real goal they're driving towards. Share some advice on on how you would help people avoid living life on autopilot and what, what could they do to sort of snap themselves out of it? Certainly listening to things like this that will inspire them to do so, but behaviorally or process wise, what can they do to uh, stop the autopilot process and really start living a inspired life? It's a great question. Well, I think if they're listening to an interview like this, they're reading your magazine. I mean, I was a little boy. I was reading Success Magazine, so I have a great affinity for your magazine, obviously. Um, I think there has to be some kind of initial hunger. If there's a hunger in you, you'll get yourself out of po- autopilot automatically. But if you want to be more effective about it, you have to be aware of how we all become conditioned and programmed to settle. I mean, when you're a young kid, almost everybody has dreams. You can ask any kid, what are you going to be? I'm going to be a pilot. I'm going to be a scientist. I'm going to be a robot. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be anything, boy or girl. It doesn't matter. And then as years go by and we experience the disappointments and frustrations and betrayals and all the things that come with life, we we don't want to be disappointed. We don't want to get hurt. So we lower our expectations. And I always say to people, you get what you tolerate, but you get what you tolerate in yourself first. And most of us don't realize it happens so slowly that we've lowered our expectations and we lowered our demands on ourselves simultaneously. And we start to find people are on autopilot because they don't want to be hurt. And the ultimate hurt is to live in autopilot. I mean, the majority of people in this country are medicating themselves. They medicate themselves through food. They medicate themselves through distraction, through television, through news. We tend to focus on things that don't matter because most of us don't have a life we're directing. We're in a position where we fit into somebody else's plan. And I would say to you, if you want to wake up, If you want to get out of that autopilot, you've got to decide today 
that I am not going to live another day of my life where I'm going to fit into somebody else's plan. It's time for me to come up with my life plan. That doesn't mean you know every detail. It just means that you're not going to medicate anymore. When things are painful, you're going to take that pain and use it as drive. Either pain destroys you or it drives you. And that's a conscious choice that every one of us makes. Most of us see it worse than it is so we don't have to try. So my view is become a leader. The way you become a leader is you see things as they really are, and then you see it better than it is. You decide what you really want for your life, and then you go figure the strategy to make that work. And the way to stay awake, if I had to give you only one thing out of all that I just rambled on to you with here with intensity, is if you want to keep awake, get around awake people. And what I mean by that is people become who they spend time with. If you want, if you get around people that won't tolerate you being asleep at the wheel, those people love you, they respect you, but they won't tolerate it. That's the greatest thing in the world. Conversely, if you and I have great skills, great abilities, great talent, great mission, we're really purpose driven human beings and we get our sounds around people that we're playing the game with uh, that aren't as good as we are. So in my life, I'm constantly saying, who do I surround myself with that I can learn from, that I can expand from, that I can contribute to, but who also, by being around them, my game, just to be on the court with them, has to raise. And also say to people, the way to get out of that autopilot state is to actually experience some passion again. Get yourself an environment with people that are driven and hungry and successful and who will not settle, and something inside you will wake up. Because you can't be around people like that without the infection, the positive infection of passion starting to touch you. So my summary would be out of all this is don't settle get around where it's better let something hit you find your passion feed your mind push yourself to your edge well i think if somebody happened to have been listening to this while riding in the car of somebody who normally reads success or was past the cd we've certainly woken up those that uh might just slumber through life but this <laughs> this magazine is really read by achievers so i just want to get one other question in before i want to move to your new book uh, and that is those that are let's say, already in the mode of achievers. Um, how do we help them be a top achiever? What do we need to help them pay attention to in order to up their game? Gosh, I would say making sure that the hunger inside you is ever increasing and not decreasing. If you look at the one factor that separates those who achieve versus those who dream, it's the level of hunger. You know, when somebody, you look at somebody, anybody that you see is the best of the best, they never lost their hunger. It wasn't enough to be successful. It wasn't enough that they were good or even great. They had to best their best. There was something inside them that had to achieve more, create more, give more, do more. And that, that hunger is the greatest gift. And people sometimes have hunger for bursts of time, and then they get to a certain level, and they think they're there. And when that happens, they lose that hunger. It's like I always say, you know, uh, our friend Jim Rohn used to talk about the idea of he said, don't sit at the table of success too long. You're going to get bored. You're going to get fat. You're not going to be happy. So, you know, if you look at uh, Kobe Bryant, I mean, he still goes out and shoots 300 shots in practice every time before he sits down. There's got to be 300 shots that are going through there. I mean, that's the level of hunger. He hasn't lost it. That's why he's still who he is today, decade and a half later from a time that a lot of people would start to lose a little bit of their edge. It's just, I think hunger is the number one piece. So anything you can do to magnify your hunger, I think the second thing that creates that hunger to keep it alive is a purpose bigger than yourself. I mean, it's, it's amazing what happens when you're trying to achieve something for yourself. You, you've got a big goal, you know, your goals affect you. Jim Rohn used to say that, whatever they are, right? But it's not just your goals for yourself. If you've got a goal for something bigger than yourself, I really believe life steps in and supports what supports more of life. In other words, motive does matter. So I think that hunger and that vision, and I think the third thing is you've got to constantly reevaluate your strategy because a lot of people are all pumped up and excited and passionate, and they're running east looking for a sunset. And I don't care how enthusiastic you are. I don't care how positive you are. That shit's not going to fly. It's not going to work. You have to. You have to constantly say, this strategy worked in the past, but is this the right strategy today? Can I get there quicker or faster? And the way to find the right strategy, of course, you and I both know is to model. Find somebody who's not good, not excellent, somebody who's outstanding. They can save you a decade in a few days. Go find those people, immerse in those people, learn from those people, study those people, and you'll change your life. So I, if I had to give you three since you asked for one, <laughs> hunger, larger vision, and constantly upgrading your strategies. Those would be the three things I'd do. Well, speaking of uh, mission and uh, doing something on a grand scale, let's talk about your new book, Money, Master the Game. Now, money is obviously one of those areas top achievers focus on, but I'm, I'm curious why this book and why now? 
I've been teaching wealth mastery for, gosh, for 30-something years. But the reason I decided to write a book for the general population, I haven't written a book in two decades. I just hate writing. <laughs> it's just the bottom truth. Sitting still for hours after hour, day after day, I love live events. But when 2008 hit, and I, I grew up extremely poor, I saw that suffering, I felt that suffering just like I was there again, and it was everybody. It was my barber, it was my billionaire clients, I mean, nobody escaped. And then when the system was supposed to be fixed and nothing happened, and 2010 came about, and I looked up and I saw, you know, nothing's changed. So I started studying what actually brought us down, and I watched a documentary that actually ended up winning the Academy Award, and it was called Inside Job, and Matt Damon did it. And if you haven't watched it, it's worth watching. But I should warn you, it'll show you systematically how we almost destroyed the entire economy of the world with a small number of people. But what was their punishment? Well, we gave them the keys to the kingdom. We gave them all their money back. We all paid for it, as most of us know at this stage. And more importantly, we put them in charge of the recovery. So they did just quite well. And it just made me so angry. And I said, you know what? Something's got to be done. And I thought, you know, what part could I play? And I thought, I have access. I have access to some of the smartest, the most brilliant financial people in the world because I've been doing this for, you know, 21 years. I'm going to go to them and I'm going to find a way to democratize this. I'm going to see, can they still win in a world where there's, you know, robo trading where instantaneously, you know, you go and try to click your E-Trade and buy, you know, Apple shares. And before you, by the time you click it, it takes 500 microseconds before that thing can be processed. They bought and sold Apple in front of you multiple times. How does a person win? Can they really win? Is it really real? I thought the only way to know is go to the best on earth. I'm not going to be one of those screaming people on television telling you buy and sell or giving you some financial entertainment. I want to know the real truth. And so I set off on what's now been almost a five-year, four-and-a-half-year journey where I interviewed the best of the best. There isn't a book like this. I interviewed 50 of the most influential, brilliant financial minds on the earth from self-made billionaires who started with nothing like Ray. He started out literally working on a golf course as a caddy. His dad was a jazz musician. His mom was you know, a homemaker to you know the, the top Nobel Prize winners on earth. And I even came up with the techniques to make you do things automatically because people don't have willpower. So I went to the best behavioral economists and got their answers as well. The whole book's then broken down to seven steps you can take yourself through to transform your financial life once and for all. Well, it is, um, I, I say it's like four books in one at least, right? I mean, it's a 700 page tome. So you really yeah. didn't hold anything back no. at all. It's all in here in one um, sort of, you know, manifesto. I wrote it so that you could basically do a chapter a day and in six weeks, you got a new wealth, you got a new life, you got a new financial world. And that's how I did it. So let's dig into it a little bit here. You mentioned uh, just in this past question, the idea of mindset. And early in the book, you talk about he how either money masters you or you master it. Describe the difference, Tony. Well, like I said, you know, money, it's its crazy. When I went to write a book on money, you look on Facebook and people, oh, that's so great. And then other people are like, he sold out. What's he doing? How evil has he become? It is the weirdest thing. There's not, there are very few things, maybe sex, religion, and politics that will produce as much emotion in human beings where they have these right, wrong mentalities and they don't even know what they're talking about 90% of the time. I mean, what what is money? It, you know, hopefully for you, it's not paramount, but it's a tool of power that can allow you to serve and can allow you to have a great quality of life if you use it properly. But power makes people really uneasy. Some people are angry about power being available. Some people are uncomfortable having it. Some people know how to utilize it for a greater good. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all made up anyway. Money, paper isn't have any real value anymore. Not in the U.S., not in most places of the world. Gold doesn't really have it. Today, it's really ones and zeros in computers. So my view is it's time to master. It's time to go deep. It's time to not let other people take control because it's the average person. They work their tail off. They build their business. They take huge risks. And at the end, most of these people don't end up with anything even close to the value. Think about it. They worked all that time. Let's say most of your business, most of the people who read your uh, magazine are salespeople, business owners, people that truly are making demands on themselves, trying to succeed and, and succeeding on a very large scale. Well, where do we put all that money? In a bank. What does the banker do? <laughs> They're the one with the experience. They give you, what, 25 basis points, 35 basis points, a quarter of a percent, a half a percent, a one percent, and then they go loan it at 18 percent on credit cards. I mean, who's the fool? You work 20 four seven and they go and do next to nothing and get these unbelievable rewards so i want to really level that and the way you level is you say i'm no longer going to be a consumer step one to, to really getting yourself on the road to financial freedom which is what this book is it's seven steps to financial freedom first step really is deciding you're no longer just going to be a consumer you're going to be an owner 
You're going to become an investor. I don't care if you start with the tiniest amount of money. You can do it because the first step is to tap into the power of compounding. We all know about it. We've heard about it. But the illusion everybody has is if I make this big score, if I just go, you know, if I get this big hit, then I'm going to be financially free. It's just not true. I mean, you can look from, you know, the best, the best athletes on earth paid the most money you could possibly imagine. The greatest actors and actresses. I, I give you 12 examples in the book because they're just, they're, they're painful and humorous simultaneously. And you see these guys, Kurt Schilling. I mean, here's a guy from the Red Sox, if you remember, two championships, you know, in Major League Baseball, going to the World Series, $100 million income. Where is he today? Broke. Totally broke. Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson made a half a billion dollars in income, personal income, half a billion, broke, <laughs> bankrupt. So it's like, it's not about the big hit. I can show you a guy that I do in the book, true story, started, never made more than 14000 a year working for UPS. And at the age of 75, he was worth $60 million. At 90, he was worth $70 million. He gave half of it away. And still have this extraordinary life. Never made more than fourteen thousand a year because he understood the power of compounding. So you gotta you gotta free yourself from this illusion that's all about making this big hit. And you gotta decide. I am no. I'm gonna become the chess piece instead of being the chess piece. I'm gonna become the chess player, not the chess piece. Mm -hmm. And this book shows you how to do that. Well, as you mentioned, they, uh, people have this weird psychosis and emotion around money and around wealth building. So I want to dispel some of these myths. You have uh, nine myths that you focus on in the book. Uh, give us the, the top couple of myths that uh, p people need to shatter in order to move themselves forward on this path of financial freedom. Well, if you start with something really basic, but let's start with where, where do most Americans who are trying to get financially free put their money, even business owners. They say, okay, I want to get, I, I know that I want tax efficiency, right? Because if I get to keep more of my money, you know, keep it working, then I'm going to get to my goals quicker. So they all put it in some version of a 401k or a Roth or something of that nature. And then where do they put their money? 99% of them put it into a mutual fund. So that presupposes something interesting. What is a mutual fund? Well, you go out and you say, I'm, I think there's somebody out there better at managing money than me, which sounds logical. You're not focused on it. You've got a day job. This person does it professionally. I mean, you know, let me find one. Let me look up Morningstar. Let's find a five-star rated mutual fund. That's probably how I'm going to do this. I'll put my money there. Couldn't make a bigger mistake in your financial life. Let me tell you why. All the research, decade after decade, shows that 96% of all mutual funds don't even match the general market. In other words... You have an option. You can pay someone to figure out what to invest and keep changing what they invest in and try and give you a better return, and they're going to charge you fees for that, sizable fees. They're going to tell you they're small. They're going to tell you one of the fees. You're going to think that's all your fees. I'll explain that in a moment. That's the second myth. And you're going to think, well, they're going to do a good job for me. 96% can't match the market where you bought the index. That simply means if you don't know what an index is, you can take the, the S&P 500, the Standard Poor's 500, and you can have a piece of the biggest 500, biggest companies in the world, the Apples, for example, the world, companies that you'd recognize, the Microsofts, et cetera, you know, the Exxons, and you can own a piece of all those companies, and that's predetermined. No one's constantly trading and exchanging, so you don't have to pay for those services. Instead of paying what you think is 1%, which is usually 3%, you might pay a quarter of a percent or less with a Vanguard to be able to own the market. And you'd be successful 96% of the time more than 96% of all other mutual funds. Let me, let me put it in perspective for you. That means only 4% of the time does somebody succeed. What are your chances of finding the 4%? What's your chance of finding that mutual fund that's going to do better than the market? Well, first of all, the 4% changes all the time. It's not the same 4%. And second of all, here's the stats. If you, do you play blackjack, Darren? No, no, not a gambler. Not a gambler. Okay, I'm not either. But you know how you know how to play. Yeah, play twenty one. Mm -hmm. So you, for those listening, I'm sure most of you know you play twenty one. But if you go above twenty one, you you all of a sudden you bust. You can't win. You're gone. You lose. Mm -hmm. So if you suddenly got you're playing blackjack and they gave you two face cards, that's worth twenty. Mm -hmm. Are you going to ask for another card? What's your chance of picking the right card? It's only one card that'll work. It's an ace. Well, it turns out if your inner idiot says, hit me, you've got an 8% chance of winning. You only have a 4% chance of getting the right mutual fund. Get out of active management. What's the second myth? A second myth is fees don't matter or they're small. The average person has no idea what they're paying in fees. In fact, well, many times when people say, what's your, you know, what are the fees? They ask the manager or the person that's selling them. They'll say, oh, it's just 1%. That's the number you hear most often. 
Well, 1% is one of the fees, right? It's only one. In fact, there's a man named Hilton Smith who did some research, and this guy's got a PhD in economics, and he was wondering why, for 10 years, he made all this stock market of doing relatively well, but he'd look at his funds, and they weren't really growing geometrically. He couldn't understand it. So he decided to make a project of studying this, and he took out one of the 52-page prospectus on one of his mutual funds, and he, he understood that even with all of his sophistication, he couldn't understand most of it. So he literally got permission to make this a project and did a dissertation where he went through all, I think he had 35 different funds that he had money into. And it took him, I believe, six weeks to go through it. And at the end, he found that on an average, there are 17 different fees. In fact, Forbes now says in the recent, most recent article that the average mutual fund costs you 3.1%. Now, somebody listening is going, who cares? 3.1%. You're forgetting the power of compounding. Fees also compound. You can start with forty dollars a week, not having a, you know having a pizza instead of going out to dinner. And if you do that once you know once a week, that's two thousand a year. You grow that at eight percent over thirty forty years. You got a half a million dollars. People just don't realize the power of compounding. But fees compound. So check this out. If you have three people that are all business people, they start a business, they work their guts out, and they're relatively young. They're thirty five, and they say we're going to. Take our million dollars. We're all going to invest it in the exact same stocks, but they go to different mutual funds to do it, and they have different fee structures. Same stocks, because same mutual funds can own. They can own the same stocks. One person's getting 1% fees, one's 2%, one's 3%. The one who paid 1% in fees, if they all grew, to give you an idea, at 7%, that person at the end of this 30-year trial would have $7.6 million. The person at 3.3% fees only has 4.3. They lost $3.3 million. They got the same rate of return. In the same stocks over the same time, the only difference is fees. One person got 77% more of their money. The other person got technically screwed. Mm. <laughs> and unfortunately, as harsh as that sounds, that's a, where else in the world can you go and buy a product? Let's say it was a car. What if you found out you bought your car for one price, but the guy next door got it for one-tenth the price that you did? You'd be mad as hell. Mm. That's what happens in the financial arena because people think it's too complex. I show you how to make it really simple. I show you how to bust through all the lies so you become an insider. You've got to know the rules of the game before you get in. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be in trouble. Well, I love it. And I can imagine that uh, you're going to upset lots of people in the financial services business as a result of that, <laughs> which is great. So let's uh, let's dig into it a little bit and we'll just cover some highlights uh, because we know where we can send people to go get the full details. There are seven simple steps that you talk about um, in mastering the game of money. The first one seems to be one of the more important ones. So I'd love to have you just address that. And that is make the most important financial decision of your life. Explain what that decision is and how we can go about making the right one for us. The most important financial decision I've mentioned earlier, but I want to make it explicit. You got to tap the power of compounding. Einstein said it's one of the greatest inventions of human curiosity, our capacity to understand how to, how to grow growth on growth, how to multiply your result. You can work a lifetime and never come close to what you can make if you can make money your slave, if you can make money, make money for you while you sleep. And the problem is people think, I got to get this big chunk of money to do it, and they're dead wrong. So, you know, I give you an overly simplistic example. I, I sat down uh, with a whole variety of people, but one of them was a, pre a professor from Princeton named Burton Malkiel, just a genius, who wrote a book called uh, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And I said to him, what's the biggest mistake that investors make? He said, Tony, the biggest mistake is they all say they understand it whenever I mention it, but they don't use it. I said, what's it? He goes, they don't tap the power of compounding. He said, they just don't do it. He said, they're all looking for a big hit. They don't understand the smallest amount of money can get you there. If you have larger money and you compound it, all the better. But it's really compounding that does it. One of the things that Malkiel shared with me as a historical fact was that Ben Franklin was a really genius of a man. He had two cities that he loved most. He loved Boston. And he loved Philadelphia. So when he died, he gave $1,000 to each city, but he put it in a covenant that said it had to stay in the market, not be touched for 100 years. And he calculated that within 100 years, there would be at least $500 million, 500, yeah, $500 million would be available there, $500,000, excuse me, so it'd be 500,000 times as much money. That's the power of 100 years of compounding. And he said, you can take out up to that amount. Anything left, you got to leave for another 100 years. And then after 200 years, each city gets it. Well, guess what? He was right. After 100 years, it was worth a lot more than $500,000. $1,000 was 500,000 times more valuable. And guess what happened? They took the money out, left the rest in, 
And then they let it go for another 100 years. And in 19, I think he did this in 1870. So it was in 1990, I think is when they finally took the money out. It was worth 6.5 million for each city mm-hmm. from a thousand bucks, 3000% compounding. So my step number one is tap the power of compounding. The way you do it is you take a percentage, as you know you should, of what you have and you automate it. You never see it. It goes straight to a separate account that's going to be an investment account. And later in the book, I show you then how to decide where to invest it. But the first step is to have that money aside. I don't care how small it is. I also show you if you have no money, you say, I can only save 3%. There's a technique that behavioral economists have come up with. One was nominated for Nobel Prize that shows you how you can take a percentage of your future earnings. You can say, okay, every time I get a raise or every time my company grows the next level, 3% is going to be set aside for my savings. And people are willing to lock that down because they're not giving up anything today. And guess what? They tried this in the Midwest with companies with people, blue collar workers that couldn't save anything, couldn't save 3%. Within 12 years, they're saving 17%. If you save 17% of your money and you put it anywhere decent, you're going to get financial financial freedom. So money, master the game. Step three is to make the game winnable. So tell us about how we stack the odds in our favor by making the game winnable, Tony. Well, just one line. I know I'm, I know I'm verbose, but cause I want to give as much as possible. I won't be verbose here. The step two, though, is remember we said you got to become an insider because once you go automate that and you got that money, you better know the rules of the game. This is a place that if you don't know the rules, you know, we all have heard it. The person with experience, a person with money meets a person with experience. The person with experience ends up with your money. So you got to know those rules. Then step three is make the game winnable. Most people never win because the number seems so huge to them. They go to a financial planner and they say, what do I do? What do I need? And they go, oh gosh, you know, I got I make a hundred thousand dollars a year. I make 50, I make 200, whatever it is. And the average financial planner, unfortunately, is not highly skilled. And I'm not being derogatory, but I'll give you a fact. I have the exact statistic in my book, so I don't want to misstate the organization, but one of the largest financial planning organizations two years ago did a study and they asked people, do you have a financial plan? These are financial planners. 46% do not have a financial plan of their own. <laughs> now, the cobbler's kids don't have shoes. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. How, why do they even admit it? That's what blows my mind. Mm-hmm. But to be fair to them, the world has gotten so complex, many of them don't know what to do. So the third step is if you do see somebody, they might say, well, okay, you have $100,000 and you want to be able to to be able to retire someday and have a $100,000 lifestyle, then you need 10 times your income. You need a million dollars. Well, that's absurd. That's saying that if I have $100,000 in the future, I have a million dollars, I can get 10% of that money in a secure environment and I can live off the income from it. Where are you going to do that today? That's absurd. It's ridiculous. So then some people tell you it's 20 times. Oh my God, I got to have two million to have a hundred thousand dollar income in the future. Or if I make a million, I got to have 20 million. That seems so gigantic. So what I do in the book is I show you there are levels of accomplishment. And if you can hit some of the early level goals, you're going to feel totally financially secure. And then you can move towards signing up financially free. Let me give you an example. If you're listening to me right now, how would you feel if you knew that you had enough money and it was in the bank and it was income coming without working? It was income from your investments that would allow you to pay for these five items and never have to work for these five items. You might work for other things, but not these five. Number one, you'd never work to pay for your house again. Your mortgage is paid for as long as you live, never had to think about it. Number two, all your utilities paid, never think about it again. Number three, food for you and your family, as long as you live, never had to pay for it, never had to worry about it. Number four, all your basic insurance needs were taken care of. You were told there. And number five, your transportation costs. If your housing, all your mortgage, your utilities, your food, your transportation, basic insurance are all taken care of, How'd you feel? Most people, I feel damn good. Well, that'll cost you about half as much as what your overall fees are, maybe 60%. And when that number comes up, I can show you how to get to that number probably 10 years, maybe 15 years sooner. And I have a little calculator, a free app that comes with the book, so you can start to play with it and you can see what it really means. It blows people's minds. I'm not trying to explain it here, but I have a whole chapter that's basically the secrets of the ultra wealthy that you can use today, even if you're just starting out. How'd you like to get your goal 10 years sooner or 35 to 50% faster. That's part of making the game winnable. So you talk about the um, the Uber investors and financial advisors that you interviewed and had access to in building this book. So let's, Tony, let's see if we can find that startling or awe-inspiring headline for this whole interview. In interviewing some of these top investors and financial advisors, what were some of the things that uh, that they divulged to you that surprised you? That you're like, really? That's 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 the secret, that's the insight, that's how the, with this works. And then what did they say that you already knew, but you feel everyone else should know as well? well I think I may, I may have revealed that to you a little bit, but I think Ray Dalio would be the best example. And I'll tell you what I learned from Ray Dalio. If you go to a financial planner um, and you are trying to figure out what to do, 
almost everyone knows, and, and hopefully listeners know, they may not know, that really success and failure in investing has nothing to do with which picks you make. Because you're, everyone's going to make wrong choices. Ray Dalio, greatest, one of the greatest investors in history, he said, point blank, I'm going to be wrong. So I have to have a system that lets me succeed even when I'm wrong. That's the secret between these people. But here's what I learned from Ray that was the most surprising thing. Most people know every time you invest, you're taking risks. One of the things I learned from Ray was a lot of people, in their, you know, when you get to, let's say, their late 40s, early 50s, Oh, someone's going to put you in what they call a balanced portfolio, like 50% in stocks or 60% in stocks and 50 or 40. They're going to put in bonds because they're going to be less volatile, supposedly. Well, then you see 2008 and everything went down. And if you lost 50% of what you had in 2008, it was time to retire. It, it's over for you. You spent a lifetime building and you lost half of it. It's, you, you, don't have, you can't afford 10 years or more to try to get back in that situation at that point. So what Ray showed me was, when you think, how did that happen? How is it possible you're supposed to be balanced and protected and you're not? And everybody else goes, well, it just happened. Ray figured out how it happened. And the reason is that stocks are three times more volatile than bonds. So you're really, if you had 50-50 or 60-40, you're like 90% at risk and 10% safe. Nobody else on earth had taught me that. It just blew my mind. So then he laid out this formula. How do you put yourself so that you're always protected? So that you always, if you lose anything, it'll be tiny. And if you win, you're going to win the most you could with the least amount of risk humanly possible. That's where all Ray's money is. That's where all the money is for his family. That's where all the money is for Ray's for his future, meaning when he passes on to be able to take care of all the charities he believes in. So he calls it his all-weather portfolio, but most of us don't have $5 billion. And if we did, he wouldn't take you anyway. So now we have this thing called All Seasons, which he designed. And it's the exact formula of how you can do well and how you can not be at risk like 90% of the rest of America and the rest of the world that doesn't understand this concept called risk parity that he created. He's a total genius. This book is designed to make you the master of your game. This book is designed to arm you for the rest of your life financially at any stage you want. It's designed to help you create a plan that's flexible and will protect you. It's designed to let you learn, peer into the minds, if you can imagine, of 50 of the richest and smartest human beings literally on the face of the earth. I got my PhD in four years in finance from the people that control the financial world. And I've tried to do is in this book is say, here's my gift back to you because I'm not making a dime on this thing. I've donated all the profits in advance, everything it'll ever do and more. I'm just saying, use this to change your own life. And if I've helped you, help me help some other people's lives as well. I'm going to feed 50 people for every book that goes out there on average if we sold a million books. And, but on top of that, I'm hoping that people do well enough that they'll say, I want to make a difference for other people as well. That will be the legacy that will come from this book. Fantastic. I love it. All right. So uh, I, I want to wrap up with, uh, with one last question, Tony. And if you just sort of back up and look at this as the topic of all human growth or all of life achievement, if you could ask yourself a question, that question that no one ever seems to ask but you know is important, what would it be? And, of course, what would the answer be? Oh, my gosh. you got some good, tough questions here. I guess one of the most important questions to answer, at least, in life is, what's it all about? What's really, you know, I, I hear so many people say, you know, I just want to be happy. And, and I just look at them and think, oh, my gosh, you're going to be miserable your whole life. Hmm. You know, happiness is not what it's about. It's about a life of meaning. There are going to be times you're going to be happy, and there are going to be times you're going to be sad. There are going to be times when things are going well and times are going poorly. But if your life has meaning, then you're always going to be rich. I mean, you know, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And so I tell people it's about meaning. And so if you want to know what's going to create happiness, if you want to know what's going to create meaning, I'd say lasting happiness comes from only one thing, progress. Progress equals happiness. If you're 30 pounds overweight and you're miserable about it, you know, you can get happy right away if you can start making some progress. If you could just start doing the right things, even before you lose the weight, you're going to start feeling better. As soon as you make progress, you lose an inch or two, you start to feel better. You go to sleep easier. You got more energy. You feel a little more sexy. All that progress feels alive. You don't have to be at $10 million to feel it. In fact, when you get to the goal, rarely does the goal fill you up for very long. You get to the goal and you go, wow, this is really great. For how long? Because we're made to make progress. We're not made to get things. You know, we both share a, a, a mentor in Jim Rohn. And Jim used to say something when I was 17. I never forgot. He said, you know, Tony, what you get will never make you happy. It's who you become. That's going to make you really happy or really sad. And so my determination for that is progress. So life is really growth and contribution. If you want to ask me, you know, what, what, what makes people fulfilled long term, that comes when you grow. And when you grow, you have something to give. And when you give something to others that's beyond yourself, that's lasting. Tony, you're always inspiring, always enlightening. And if uh, anybody listening, if any of this has piqued your interest or 
reveal maybe even a shortcoming that you might have as it relates to your knowledge of money and what you're doing with your own. You now have a great, all-encompassing and very comprehensive resource called Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins. Tony, thank you so much. Always a delight. Thank you for being with us here at Success. My pleasure, Darren. Look forward to seeing you soon.